chair with a mouse in its jaws. <laughs> All right, so one turtle, two hummingbirds, three mongoose. <laughs> turtle. All right, here's Mary. It's true. <laughs> All right, who said I was the one with the drink? I've seen you guys. I've seen you guys. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for coming out tonight. And I'm so honored to sit and talk to you a little bit about sleep medicine. I have to read disclaimers, though. The clinic told me this. So everybody in attendance tonight, please do not feel that you're my patient, OK? <laughs> so any advice I share tonight, it is not personalized or considered care for you. So that, that's one. Uh, any products I might bring up tonight, except for the beer, um, they're not affiliated with me or the Marshfield Clinic. So that's the other. And I have no other disclosures. So that was the technical stuff I had to read for all y'all. So the first thing I have to ask is, how many people in this room have heard of sleep apnea? Please put up your hands. Of the people that have heard of sleep apnea, how many of you, either yourself or loved one, have sleep apnea and are being treated? All right, perfect. How many in this room have no idea what sleep apnea even means? Hey, that's a plus. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so just to start out with a basic definition of sleep apnea, most of my patients come in and they're like, what is apnea? What is that? All it means is a cessation of breathing when you sleep. And it has to last for at least 10 seconds. That's what we usually look for with sleep apnea, which can be pretty scary for the people that said loved ones have sleep apnea. If you've ever witnessed someone with sleep apnea, you might notice loud snoring, right? The, sh the rafter shakers, the people you put in another room down the hallway. How many of you guys in here hunted a cabin? Nobody? Couple? Yeah, OK. Um, a lot of people come in around hunting season and say, the guys wanted me to sleep in my car because they couldn't sleep because I snore so loudly. One of the other scarier parts that I hear from a lot of patients, loved ones, though, is he was sleeping or she was sleeping and they quit breathing and I counted and I couldn't even sleep that night because I kept counting how long it was that they didn't take a breath. It was ready to get the mirror out and put it under their nose, you know. So again, sleep apnea, cessation of breathing, that's kind of what we look at for sleep apnea. Now, the important thing to know about sleep apnea is we have to test for sleep apnea. I can't just look at any of you and say, I think you have sleep apnea because you're falling asleep as I'm talking. Or maybe you snore. When you come to my office, I usually will ask you a ton of questions, but I also give you a ton of information. I usually go over with patients, of course, like 50 questionnaires that they have to fill out, and I want to know if they snore, if they feel like they're really tired when they wake up in the morning, if they take really long naps during the day. Sometimes people will say they get really bad memory fog. They just can't remember things. Or they wake up in a panic. They wake up maybe six times a night and they don't know why. They think they have to go to the bathroom because they had so much beer. And it's really their sleep apnea waking them up. So again, all these questions that we ask, we really kind of have to drill down if we think that a person would qualify for a test for sleep apnea. So with sleep apnea, how many people would think that it's a dangerous thing that could actually cause death. Very good, you guys have been doing your homework. That is one of the worst things I talk to my patients about. People with sleep apnea, of course, that is the worst thing that they just don't wake up, their bodies don't wake them up from breathing for whatever reason. But all sleep apnea, especially since we're not breathing when we're sleeping, our oxygen levels start to go down. And I'll see that on a lot of reports. When your oxygen levels go down, does your body like oxygen? Yes. yes. It's actually a nutrient for your vital organs. So things like your brain for memory fog. People with heart conditions can have atrial fibrillation. People can have different heart failures. And it could be actually contributing from their sleep apnea over the years because they had the low oxygen levels. People that wake up and they have that fight or flight because they wake up and panic. Cortisol levels go up, adrenaline goes up, your body's in this fight or flight. If you keep doing that all these years, think of the, the detriment it can have on your vital organs. Some people can have heart attacks when they wake up from sleep apnea. Some people can have strokes because of that. It's a very serious condition. 
So I never mean to scare my patients, but I always like to let them know it can be very, very serious, and I'm always very, very glad that they come in my door, especially if they are snoring or having other symptoms. Other things we talk about in usually my, my uh, one-on-one -on -one with the patient is, well, I ask you all these questions, what am I going to do? I'm going to test you for sleep apnea if I really think you have a red flag. Anybody in here, because you all, you know, kind of knew what sleep apnea was, when you had your loved ones or even yourself, did you remember them saying they had to sleep overnight in a lab to have a sleep study done? Yeah, some people don't like that. They're like, I don't want to get uh, hooked up and have to have someone watch me on a camera sleep. But there's also another alternative called a home study that we can actually send patients home with as well. A lot of people don't know that. It's a little easier for some people if they qualify for it. Now, if you come in and tell me, Mary, I've got a heart condition, Mary, I've got a lung condition, I've got all these other conditions, I might not be able to order a home study for you. We might have to do that lab study, but there are options. So never be afraid to come and ask. So once I get those study results back, I look at numbers. The first mild case of sleep apnea is considered five times per hour that you're not breathing properly. They're called events. That's a mild case. I have patients come in at 100. So you can imagine from mild to severe cases kind of what buckets I have to put people in for different treatment options. Some people come in and they have no idea that they have sleep apnea because they've had it for so many years. They'll come back with hundreds of events per hour and they can't believe it. They're like, I don't, I, there's no way. So once we know if you have sleep apnea, the next thing I talk to the patient about is, how do I treat your sleep apnea? How many of you have seen those little CPAP machines or the pressure machines? They're about this big, okay. That's usually one of the treatments that are a gold standard for sleep apnea. You can treat mild, moderate, or severe cases of sleep apnea. It is just pressure. Some people can hook up oxygen tanks, but most people just need the room air with the machine. And with the uh, obstructive type of sleep apnea, all that machine does is open up your passage. So with obstructive sleep apnea, if you think about your tongue, your mouth, kind of your throat back here, when you lay down, you sleep, what happens? You relax. What happens to this tissue? It relaxes. You try to take a breath in, what happens? It vibrates. That's your snore right there. The other people that say they wake up going like that, they wake themselves up or their loved one says you quit breathing, that means there's no air getting through. That's another form of obstructive sleep apnea. That's where these machines really come in handy because they will sense that obstruction for patients. So while you're sleeping, you don't even know it, it pushes the pressure out, holds that passage open, so when you breathe, you're actually getting air and oxygen. That's the best part of the machines, again, mild, moderate, severe cases. Anybody ever seen an oral appliance for sleep apnea? Couple people. If you think of like a bite guard that people might wear, they actually have oral appliances for milder to lower moderate cases of sleep apnea, again, the obstructive type. Everybody grab your chin. Pull it out just a little bit. What happens here? Tissue goes ahead, doesn't it? So what happens with the oral appliance is the dentist will make it, one upper plate, one bottom plate, and the bottom plate actually sits out like this. So when you sleep, you just have to wear that to sleep, and again, it can open up this passage for you. Some people like that option better, but again, mild to moderate cases. So you can see there's a few different options, not just one machine that you have to wear. Now that's obstructive sleep apnea. The other is called central sleep apnea, kind of a scary one. It means your brain, for whatever reason, isn't telling your body to take a breath. Could be medication, could just be something physical, neurological things that we handle in our office all the time can be a cause of it as well. There is a machine, though, that we can treat central sleep apnea with, about the same size as the other ones, just does a whole different thing for you. So again, all treatable. The last thing is, how many people in here watch television? Everybody's hand goes up. How many of you have seen a commercial about the Inspire procedure? A couple people. I get a lot of questions on this lately. All the Inspire procedure is is a device about uh, that big. And there's a lead wire that's attached to that device. A surgeon will actually surgically implant that in your chest wall. And then that little wire goes to the hypoglossal nerve by your tongue. So it's like a nerve stimulator. So you hit a remote control when you go to bed at night and it stimulates the tissue open and the tongue forward. 
in the morning you shut off the device. One of the newer procedures out there, but people are asking a lot of questions about it. Criteria right now is pretty long, but we do work with patients uh, regarding that treatment as well. And they do the procedures, uh, I don't know about Aspirus too much, but we do ours through the Marshfield Center. So it is again possible for people in Manaqua to be referred for that. So that's kind of the treatment that we uh, do for sleep apnea. Um, the other thing I always tell patients too is, I'm not going to forget about you. I'm not going to send you home with a machine or an oral appliance and say, nice seeing you, thanks for coming in. You got to come back and see me, like it or not. So I want to make sure that you're getting good treatment with your, your machine or your oral appliance or even your Inspire procedure. And once we know that you're good and ready to go, I see people then on a kind of a yearly basis for things. So with sleep apnea, again, we know how to treat it. We know how to test for it. We know what to uh, talk about with patients who experience it and what they need to watch out for, how dangerous it can be. Anytime you deplete that oxygen in that body, just think vital organs, brain, heart, lungs, everything. People with gastric, uh, you know, like GERD, gastric acid reflux, things like that can also be caused by sleep apnea. So it really affects your whole entire system. I don't have a lot of statistics to tell you for Wisconsin, but I did try to find a couple for sleep apnea uh, on the site today. Uh, men, unfortunately, men, you got it bad. 13% of men over the age of 50 probably have some type of sleep apnea. Whereas women, we're only at about 6%. So women have a little less case that we see. Some of the uh, details from the AASM stated it's probably because of hormones. So once we get a little older ladies, our hormones aren't there for us anymore helping us out. So that's when our sleep apnea might actually start to rear its ugly head and we might need some treatment. Uh, on average, um, how many hours a night do you think you should actually sleep for an adult? Just throw some numbers at me, guys. Seven, eight, two, who said two? <laughs> Nine, you said two. Not how many do you get, how many should you get? Average adult is about seven to nine hours. So if you're not getting that, you're going to start depleting your sleep and you really should change your pattern a little bit. They do have cognitive therapies out there to help people get better sleep hygiene. How many people in here sleep with a television on in their room? Oh, you're not going to raise your hands, are you? I see a couple. Okay. Yeah, one thing about televisions, and I know some people have to have them on, but it also can stimulate your brain because of the blue light and the noise. You might wake up in the middle of the night because uh, some scary movie comes on or something and you hear the noise. That's just considered sleep hygiene. So again, dark room is best, cool room is best. No electronics for a couple hours before you go to bed so you don't stimulate the brain to stay awake. That can all be helpful to get that night's sleep. Alcohol, like beer. Do you think it's good or bad for sleep? Bad. You guys have really been looking this stuff up. I love it. Yeah, it says they're drinking beer, hey. Yeah, and that's what usually happens with alcohol. You might feel really sleepy when you drink it, but most people get really sleepy. They sleep for a few hours and they're wide awake or they wake up and they just can't fall back. It causes insomnia for a lot of people. So it's always best to limit your alcohol a couple hours before bed as well. I know, right? Put that beer down. Put that beer down. <laughs> Um, so sleep does impact health performances, um, safety. Uh, if people aren't getting their sleep, just even the seven to nine hours, they don't even have to have sleep apnea, what happens? You get behind the wheel of a car, you're going to fall asleep. Um, some people do have narcolepsy and things like that that we know about, but you really need your sleep, guys, so make sure that you're really watching your sleep hygiene. Um, and waking up, if you're waking up and you feel like you just have that fight and flight, please make sure, again, to talk to your medical professional. You don't need to talk specifically to me. Again, I'm, I'm just uh, working at a clinic right now, but talk to your doctor. Doctors, your primary care providers, can order these tests. They can take care of it for you, so it's not like you have to go to a sleep specialist for them to diagnose and treat. All right, and I don't know where I'm at with time. Am I good? Yeah. She was going to cut me off because I have a habit of talking a lot, so. <laughs> no, this is excellent. Okay, let's take some questions. And uh, Amber is going to be walking around with uh, the microphone, so please wait for her to come up to you and remember to hold the microphone close to your mouth. Like this? Very good. <laughs> Two-part question. Yes, one part. Okay, the first part, how easy is, like, how do these, like, apps and things work? 
like you can, there's tons of apps advertised for Android yeah. and iPhones. And then, so that kind of ties into my second question is, can you treat yourself? <laughs> and how are outcomes in uh, professional settings? Absolute. So, good questions too. Um, artificial intelligence, your little apps, your wrists, you know, all those little pads that they have now, they're fine as tools, but don't go by that. We really need a sleep study for patients because they're so specific so we can tell what type of sleep apnea, how bad it is. But apps are great. I have patients coming in all the time showing me their little apps, and they're all different, so I'm, I'm old school. I'm like, I don't know what that means, but show me your app anyway. Um, but they're good because a lot of people have caught their sleep apnea by using the app. So, yeah, absolute. We're, we're great with any tool that brings you in our door so we can help you out is a good thing. Um, so your other question is, you know, what percentage? I don't know percentage exactly, but what I strive for every patient is to get them under five events per hour, because five events per hour is that first mild case of sleep apnea. So when I treat with oral appliances or machines, even the Inspire procedure, we try to get people under that number. Because if you don't get under that number, you still have sleep apnea, even though you're being treated. So that's kind of our goal uh, with sleep medicine, and we, we work around whatever we have to. So. Some people have a problem with the machines. How many in here are claustrophobic? Those are my patients that come in like, I cannot wear that machine, Mary. I cannot have that thing on my face. So again, we try to work with what we have and uh, offer different solutions to those patients as well. Did I answer your question? Yes, thanks. You're welcome. Do you have another one behind? Oh, I guess mine is also along the uh, lines of, you know, Oh, okay, thank you. Um, when, when you. Let's say you have the Inspire put in, mm -hmm. and you find out this person really wants the Inspire put in, and hey, it's, it's going to work, and then they find out it doesn't work at all. Then what happens? I mean, this is a huge procedure. Yeah, it's a surgical procedure. Yeah. Uh, with the Inspire, they can be removed. So if patients aren't tolerating it well, they can, it's a device that can be removed from them. They actually do have to change them out, I think, every 10 or 11 years for battery, so it's another procedure. Um, but for the Inspire, they're kind of, um, they kind of can do the printouts like we get with the regular CPAP machines, where I can print your machine off and I can see how many hours you slept, how many events per hour you had with your machine on. That's how I kind of monitor how your treatment's going. Inspire can do that too. They have the program in that device, the implant, so they can actually go in and pull a report and data off of your device. And they can also regulate the stimulator. So if they have to increase that, that jolt of the nerve stimulator, they can open up your passage more or turn it down for some people. Yeah. So yeah, and it's been very popular. I get a lot of questions. I've made a, quite a few referrals. I don't get a lot of patients back because they monitor at Marshfield right now. But I've been hearing that they've had some really good success with it. So we're hopeful. We're hopefully that uh, this is just the start of that. Yeah. How, how does that jolt feel? Can you feel it when it jolts your hypo hypoglossal? Or? The one patient I did have, <laughs> he told me that with his tongue he was having issues. Because, again, it's a nerve stimulator. Your tongue is stimulated by the nerve here, the hypoglossal nerve. So when he first started using it, his tongue was pushing forward and he'd start getting kind of a quivering tongue, we'll say. It drove him crazy. So he had to go back in, but they did get him regulated. Um, but it does. I mean, it's a, it's a nerve impulse. So any nerve around, it's going to take advantage of that nerve and open that tissue. But they can regulate it and adjust it. I'm the next question asker. Got it. This could be either subjective or objective. Yeah. <laughs> Subjectively... I always slept on my belly growing up, then on my side, and now I'm kind of working on maybe I should sleep on my back. Which one is the better way to sleep? <laughs> Subjective, objective. You can answer Very it either good. way or both. Very good. Well, if you have central sleep apnea, the one where the brain doesn't tell the body to take a breath, usually doesn't make much of a difference. But for the obstructive sleep apnea, that makes the difference. What does gravity do? pulls down. So when you're laying on your back, what happens to this tissue? Falls back even farther. So back is usually the worst position for obstructive sleep apnea because of that. It's just a gravity thing. Side, the, the back lay, when you lay on your back, not, not, your, not your tummy, right? Just get the pillow out of your way. <laughs> um, the other side's positions are usually the best. So left or right side, because again, with gravity, it'll pull the tissue one way or the other. But again, you're still going to have sleep apnea. 
People ask me too, if I sleep in my recliner, will I take it away? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> Might make it a little better. No, it's not. It's not going to do much. We've got to keep it open. So just switching positions isn't going to cure or take care of your sleep apnea. How many people in here think you can cure sleep apnea? One person. One person? Really? Two people? Three maybe? <laughs> really depends on your sleep apnea. Again, centrals, you're really probably not going to find a cure for it. Obstructive, though, weight loss, because we're dealing with tissue. So if you lose a lot of weight, I get a lot of people with, like, the bypass surgeries, the lap band surgeries, all the gastrointestinal surgeries. They maybe drop 20 to 100 pounds, and they come back. We test them, and it's gone. Other people, maybe decreased a little bit, but they still have it. So it really depends on the person. Go ahead. I have a question back here. Oh. Oh, oh, gotta get a microphone. Oh, wait, you got, hold on. Don't lose the question, okay. Hey, um, sorry. Um, you mentioned that sleep apnea affects um, mainly blood oxygen levels, and so what is the difference between the oxygenated levels of blood for like mild patients versus severe, and then whenever the severe patients get treated, how close to normal can that get back to? Excellent. So oxygen saturations, how many of you have worn one of those like in the hospital or maybe for fun at home? I don't know what you do, but okay. So that's just the oxygen saturation machine a lot of you have seen on your finger if you've been a patient somewhere. What it measures is the percent of oxygen in your bloodstream. 90% or above is normal. That's what we look at. When you do the sleep studies, I'll actually get the data back so when you have those apneic episodes, we can see how low it can tank down, which some people can go pretty low. I've seen it in the 60s and 70s on some patients. Again, it depends on the severity of your sleep apnea. With treatment of the sleep apnea, we don't measure that with every visit, but we measure symptoms. So if people are saying, I'm breathing better, I'm feeling better, I'm not as tired, we know that this passage is open, your numbers are looking great, you're getting air. The biggest problem, though, is with my chronic lung people, so like the COPD, other lung diseases, sometimes that's a little more difficult, and we do have to monitor that closely. But for a normal, average person, if we get your uh, obstructive sleep apnea under control, usually your SATs pop right back to normal. Okay. Did you get a microphone? Oh, back here. Oops, is, is there a common dream scenario that pre-diagnosed patients experience? A dream scenario, like a common dream theme? Yeah. I don't know about themes as much, but a lot of patients don't remember their dreams with sleep apnea because they don't get into that REM sleep because they keep waking up. So that is one of the questions we'll ask. I know people will say, too, you know when I fall asleep, I feel like I'm falling off a cliff. How many of you have had that? You're like, oh, when you wake up? Yeah. Sometimes it can be related to sleep apnea, but most of the time it's just something that you're falling asleep, you're like in a twilight sleep, and you kind of wake up and jump. But no, there's really not a common theme of type of dream. A lot of patients, though, with sleep apnea say, no, I don't remember my dreams. I think I dream, but I really don't remember them. Oh, what's the question here? Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, my son has sleep apnea, and he says that when he loses just a small amount of weight, that it makes a huge difference. And also, he says that diet makes a big difference. What, you know, mm -hmm. different foods that you eat can contribute to it. Is that? Um, maybe not the sleep apnea, but uh, yes, weight loss of any type can help sleep apnea. Again, if, especially if you lose it in this area. For diet, if you have gastric acid reflux issues, that could put extra pressure on that tissue and cause worsening symptoms of sleep apnea. So that might be where diet cuts in or helps. But as for just diet or certain foods to eat that'll take care of sleep apnea, not really, unless you're, again, on a weight loss program and you're striving to lose weight for it. But I bet he does feel different because, yeah, I'll, I'll have patients come in, they lose, again, like 10, 15 pounds, and they're like, wow. Yeah, yeah, some people are very sensitive. I usually repeat sleep studies, though, especially if people are saying they're feeling better or had that weight loss sustained for at least six months. I'll say, hey, why don't we just do a home test and see how you're doing? It's easy enough to do. Most insurances cover those things, too, if you have a sustained weight loss. Mm -hmm. So the sleep cycle, uh, how does sleep apnea affect, like, the REM versus deep sleep and all of those phases of the sleep cycle? And it, does it have, a, like, a bigger effect on certain parts versus others? Well, we have different uh, sleep cycles. You know, you have uh, non-REM sleep, where there's like three cycles of that. So that's like your twilight sleep and when you awake and sleep. 
REM is only like 25% of our sleep, believe it or not. You'd think that that deep sleep would be a lot more. Um, but how it affects people is a lot of patients with the sleep apnea can't get to that deep REM sleep where you can really relax and your, your blood pressure is nice and steady and you know, your, your heart is functioning well and you're just at a normal kind of status when you're sleeping. They don't hit that because they're jumping around so much. It's a sleep disturbance, so it keeps waking you up. Even if you don't think you're waking up, you might just feel exhausted when you get up during the day. So it affects really all, but REM is probably the biggest effect for the sleep apnea because, again, a lot of people don't get to that point, and that's where they're feeling so tired the next day. I know I've seen someone run with the microphone again. Here we go. Okay, okay as far as uh, sleep hygiene, mm -hmm. uh, kind of different than sleep apnea, but um, if, uh, do you have more people reporting trouble falling asleep or people waking up in the middle of the night, you know, falling asleep and then waking up at a certain time, unable to continue sleeping? Uh, which, which one do more people complain about? Probably, probably all, actually, because it depends on your sleep hygiene. If people are waking up in the middle of the night, one of my first questions is, what time do you go to bed? Some people like to go to bed at 6 p.m. and they get up at 3 and they think, why am I up at 3? Well, it's because you went to bed at 6. <laughs> but some people like to go to bed at midnight and then they have to get up and go to the bathroom 10 times. Well, that's disturbing again your sleep. It might be the bathroom, it might be that you have sleep apnea. Um, some people, though, also, you know, they'll just say, well, you know, I, I go to sleep at a good time. I wake up in the middle of the night, maybe I have to go to the bathroom, have a hard time falling back to sleep. Do you nap during the day? Nappers are huge. I mean, one to two hour nap is a lot. So if people are taking those long naps during the day, I usually say, maybe set an alarm for a 30 minute nap, so that way you'll sleep better at night. Um, some people though do need some over the counter. We you know, talk about different products that can be used over the counter to help with that as well. But again, you have to talk to your doc about that because it can interfere with other medications. And there are medications that can help too if it truly is an insomnia. But always remember how much blue light we get. Blue light, blue light, cell phones, blue light, iPads, blue light. People are like, oh, I read my book. Did you read a book or did you read your iPad? Most of them are iPads nowadays. Again, blue light stimulates brain, and that's going to have a hard time getting you to sleep and even staying asleep for some people. Well, see, I, I read at night. Yeah. And uh, because I like, I like, I read on my, I read on my computer, okay, I, and uh, I have no problem. I turn, off, I turn off the computer, I go to sleep, and I fall asleep just fine. But then at 2 in the morning, I'll wake up, you know, because I go to the bathroom. Yep. And then I have trouble getting back to sleep. Um, I go to bed usually around 8.30, 9 o'clock. So I end up with about five, six hours of sleep a night. And, and I'm a napper, too. So, mm -hmm. uh, but, but the blue light doesn't keep me from falling asleep. I just go right, right away. If I'm yeah. reading, finish reading, I just go boom, okay. sleep. And some people it doesn't. It yeah. can be a stimulant for some people. But again, you know, for nappers, I usually say try to limit that to see if it helps. Make sure, again, it's a cool room, dark room, that kind of thing. Um, don't drink excessive fluids before bed, so maybe that'll limit getting up and going to the bathroom as much. You know, it really depends on the person for that. But if you continue to have problems, I always say talk to your doc, because there are some, you know, aids out there that you can use even over the counter that can be helpful for you. For the blue light, yeah. do those glasses you can buy that block blue light, do they really help? Like I don't think they no. would, yeah. So reading in yeah. bed on a, yeah. an electronic device, I, I think, don't yeah. do it. <laughs> Get a good old-fashioned book if you want, right? If you're having problems, that's the key. If you're falling asleep when you go to bed, you don't have problems with insomnia, and you're reading your iPads or your computers, great. But it's for people that are having issues that you've got to kind of backtrack and say, well, what are you looking at? What is, what is your pattern? How are you sleeping? How many hours are you sleeping? How many naps do you take? What do you eat or drink before bed? You know, again, if you're having a lot of beer tonight, you might wake up at 2 in the morning and you don't want to go back to sleep. <laughs> I don't know where the microphone is. There we go. For the people who have been diagnosed with sleep apnea, have you noticed a difference in severity and numbers between whether they are mouth breathers or nasal breathers? A lot of people that I have, believe it or not, when I start treating with sleep apnea, especially the machines, 
There's different masks for the machines. You can have one over your nose and mouth, kind of covering your face for you claustrophobic people out there. But it's a bigger mask. Some people just like the little nasal masks. Sometimes when you start those machines, if you're even a mouth breather, because you're getting that pressure and that air, they stop mouth breathing. Their mouth stays shut all night long. It's just the weirdest thing, but it really happens. Other people, their mouth still drops open. They do have chin straps for the headgear that can kind of softly hold your mouth shut. So again, there's so much different equipment out there to help with patients. Some people, though, just can't. They're like, I can't do the nasal type masks, and they have to have something over their mouth. So again, so many different products out there that they can try for that, just as long as they're comfortable with it. We have an online question about mouth tape, wondering if it's effective or something that they should try. Well, I know it is out there. If you talk to my sleep lab technicians, they're going to say, tell people to throw that away. <laughs> because <laughs> We don't know the adhesive on that tape. I mean, what if it doesn't open up and you start, you know, choking? I mean, I usually tell patients, you probably don't need mouth tape. We probably have to get you some other type of treatment if you're having issues like that. So we don't usually recommend it, but I know it's out there. I know some dentists recommend it as well. Again, my office usually does not recommend mouth tape. Duct tape either, guys. Just saying. <laughs> I see some of you. I see you. Okay. All right. Go ahead. Um, I've heard about links between kind of sleep behaviors and things like Alzheimer's or brain health, especially as we age. Is there, like, what's your perspective on that and thoughts? Yeah, definite link. And that's through the American Association of Sleep Medicine on their site. They have a lot of great information on there. Uh, dementia is being linked to sleep apnea because of the low oxygen levels for some people at night. So if a dementia is being related, Alzheimer's dementia, I'm sure, also would be related. There's not a lot of studies out there, but I have read some that can refer it because of the memory fog and the, and the memory issues and the problems. You're breaking down a vital organ. You start lacking oxygen, that tissue starts to die. It starts to break, and that's when people run into trouble. So yes, there are some really cool studies out there about how it is linked. I have an online question here. Are people who live in quiet country areas less likely to have sleep issues than people who live in noisy cities? Hmm. A noisy city, I think, would be a lot of stimulus for some people. But I live on a busy main street where I live. I sleep like the dead, so I don't know. I think it's a kind of personalized choice for that. Um, I would think, uh, for me, living in the bigger cities my whole life, sleeping in a quiet country setting, I probably wouldn't be able to sleep at all. So I think it's really what your body's used to. I don't think there's one best way or the other. If your noise is bothering you, though, or the lights, street lights, if you live in town, something like that, of course, you want to deal with that. And if in the country and you're having problems, white noise machines, if you're a city slicker like me and you move to the rural areas and you need that little background noise, again, nothing blue light, but they do have those little apps even that you can get on your phone for some white noise when you sleep, and those work great for people. Everybody, too, breathing. I know, breathing, right? Yeah, you take uh, a breath in for a count of five. Everybody take a breath in, count to five in your head. Hold it for five, count in your head. And release for five, and count in your head. Do that five times when you're laying in bed. See if it helps you fall asleep. Hmm. Sometimes just that rhythmic breathing, it takes your mind off of events, because all of us are stressed in life these days with all the things happening. Um, sometimes just calming down like that, focusing on your breathing can really help you fall asleep better, too. I appreciate that comment on the five-second breathing. I'm going to do that tonight. Um, I know a lot of talk about sleep apnea is hot right now, um, but I'm wondering about insomnia and what causes that when it seems like all things considered, it's a normal life, you know, you have a normal day, you go to bed at... 10 or 11 and you get up to go to the bathroom and then you lay there for three hours for mm -hmm. no apparent reason. So again, sleep hygiene. Watch your stress levels. Sometimes insomnia can really be related to that. So you might have to change things around a little. We have a great program. It's called Cognitive Behavioral Therapy at the clinic. We have a doctor that specializes in it for cases like that. So insomnia patients, I usually refer because he's a specialist at it and he works with patients on how to change their sleep around and he'll give you a lot of great ideas on therapies that you can try for insomnia. Unfortunately, sometimes we do have to do medications for insomnia though, but we try that at the last stage. 
Um, but insomnia can come from a lot of things. You know, it can be stress. It can be, you know, just chemicals in your body. It can be, you know, other diseases that are causing it, medications that might be causing it that you have to take for other conditions. So a lot of different things can actually kind of be linked to insomnia. It's just finding that individual plan for that person to say, well, let's try this, we'll start slow, and we'll move up the line to see how we can help you. Because you know, we need sleep. If we don't have sleep again, we're going to start breaking down our systems, immune systems, our bodies, our vital organs, everything's affected. Um, oh. Can cortisol levels be um, linked to the severity of it? Cortisol levels? Yes, like stress levels. Absolutely. Your fight and flight that we talked about for sleep apnea, a lot of times when you wake up with that fast rush like that, it's a fight and flight response. Cortisol and adrenaline are usually the two culprits of that. And cortisol is the one that kind of deals with your blood sugars. So when your brain needs that quick fight and flight, it's going to pump out the sugar so you move fast because that bear's right behind you. And in, you wake up and sleep doing that, your body doesn't know it's not a bear chasing you, but you just woke up because you have sleep apnea. So your sugars are going to start going up. People that have issues with sleep apnea, diabetes is huge. Um, obesity is huge because the ghrelin production, you have increased appetite, you're not sleeping good, the cortisol is affecting your blood sugar levels. So yes, they're all tied together very closely. In um, all of your research and working with clientele, have you found a specific, maybe rare population that just functions just fine under four to five hours without no long-term effects? Well, I don't know about long-term effects, but yes, most college students I think are probably under that, or med students especially, right? Um, some people will tell me that, especially truck drivers, I only need two hours of sleep, I can go drive that big rig. Yeah, no. No. <laughs> you will get sleep deprivation eventually. It's going to build up in your body. When you're a little younger, like teenage years, you'll notice how many people have teenagers or teenage grandkids around? How much do they sleep? My son, I had to roll out of bed. It's like, come on, honey, it's been 12 hours. So again, kind of, you know, where your age cycle is, is might be effective of that. Your young adulthood, you might not need as much because you're more active. As we get older sometimes, though, we don't need as much sleep as we did when we were younger because we're less active. So it kind of goes in different phases. I don't really know of like one common phase that'll say, you know, four to five hours is good for me. It's pretty individualized with that. And again, it's how you feel. It's how you're, you're functioning. Are your mood swinging? Are you feeling tired? Are you, you know, jumping at your husband or wife? <laughs> or yelling at the kids or the dogs more? Uh, it can really affect your mood if you have lack of sleep. On that same exact note, I'm this almost exact same way and I've been doing it for 33 years now and I don't notice differences in any of those things. Can, I don't know how that's going to affect me long term, but I've literally only gotten three to five hours of sleep for almost 30 years. So, Yeah, and again, seven to nine is usually adult, you know, a healthy adult. So will it catch up to you? I'm going to guess yes. So, you know, trying to improve your sleep habits might help. I'm not sure if there's something that is interfering with your sleep, but, you know, you might want to talk to your doc about it. Maybe some cognitive behavioral therapies about some insomnia issues. Um, hard to say. Again, everybody is built so differently. So if you're feeling good and you feel like it's enough, but if you start noticing the moods of the changes, and as we get older, you might actually feel the effect from that. It's hard to say. Is there seasonality to our sleep? Patterns. Yes, I want to hibernate every winter. Absolutely. <laughs> right now seems to be a driver of my yes, sleep pattern. Yes, absolutely. Uh, people are stimulated again by light. So if you think of seasonal things in the summer, people might get up at 4 in the morning because they see the sun shining. Other people, you know, winter comes and I ain't crawling out of this bed because it's cold outside, it's dark outside, it's 10 o'clock in the morning. So yes, it is affected by that as well as seasonal depressions and things, too, that we always hear about. Sleep can have that effect as well. Do you have any um, ideas on alternative solutions for insomnia, as such as vibrational therapy? Um, I've heard of vibrational therapies, again, individualized for that. Are you talking about the vibrator uh, little... Tuning forks. Yes, the tuning forks and things. I've heard it can, and there's also alternative therapies out there, you know, um, like Reiki massages, you know, anything like that. Again, you just have to kind of try different things. I've not had a lot of studies about it, especially alternative type, you know, medicines or treatments. Um, but 
why not? I and mean, tuna fork's not going to hurt anything. So if you want to try it and it helps, go for it. Uh, how about tongue ties? I know a lot of like kids get tongue tie revisions. Is that something that could help adults possibly with sleep apnea? A what? A tongue tie revision. A tongue? Yeah. <laughs> A tongue tie? Yeah, like the tissue under your tongue or like lip ties. Oh, no, we've not tried that in the adult <laughs> population. I'm like, what are you talking about? No, no. And again, it'd be a tissue thing. If somebody is going in for oral surgeries as well, they might have to move the tissue forward, especially young kids. So, yeah, we usually don't use it in adults unless they're going to ENT for some procedures. I thought you said tongue tie, and I'm like, what? <laughs> That does remind me, though, I know quite a few people that have gotten some kind of nasal surgery, like mm -hmm. routing out their nasal passages or something like that. Oh, I mean, yeah. That's essentially what it is, right? Well, there's different types. Ah, um, okay. Yeah, your nose and throat doctors usually do those. If people have deviated septums, sometimes they can do like a nasal surgeries for that. Um, other people will have the soft palate surgeries, and they literally scrape your soft palate. And that little thing in the back of your throat that looks like a V, it's called a uvula they'll actually remove that and tonsils. So people can have some pretty extreme oral surgeries for their sleep apnea. Can work for some people, but unfortunately I've had a lot of people that have had that done and still have to have some type of treatment. So, but it is out there. And some people do need it because of that tissue. If there's too much, they do have to remove some. But yeah, they do have different surgeries for whatever ails you. <laughs> We've got an online question. Uh, what can you say about all the people who take Ambien to fall asleep? Oh yeah, mm, the Ambien. Um, sleep medications are the last thing that I usually treat insomnias with. Because again, we try to find that root cause. They can be very addicting. Sometimes you use them long enough, you gotta keep increasing the doses because your body gets used to it. So it can run into a lot of problems with people. It also interacts with a lot of other medications for people, and it can get very groggy the next day. There's so many potential side effects. One of the last resorts we use are any type of sleep medications, per se. We try everything else first. Any other hands going up? How big is the network of like sleep supporters here in the region? Like, are you like how many sleep clinics or other practitioners? Is it easy to get access to help when you have sleep issues? Sure. Sleep issues again. You can talk to your primary care provider in Manaqua because I know it's Manaqua, right? We're not in the middle of you know Chicago where we got a lot of opportunities for sleep medicine providers. So you can always check with your primary care providers. Right now at my clinic, I'm pretty much the only one there. I do have one neurologist coming up from WASA about once a week, Dr. Biswas, if any of you know him. Um, he'll come up and help see some patients. But yeah, for my clinic, I'm it. I don't think uh, Aspirus has someone here right now from what I hear. I don't know, again, a lot about them. Um, so yeah, I would always start with your main doctor if you can't get in. It can be kind of difficult, unfortunately, sometimes to get in for an appointment. I have a two-part question. Um, I'm curious because there is some recent research on a four-stage cycle of sleeping and the possibility of potentiality of relating to childhood um, diagnosis such as autism because there's a pruning phase in the sleep and the synapses are haywire and not being pruned in a young child who develops autism. Curious if you could piggyback on that with any other research that I am not aware of yet. Just working with um, early ch ch the early childhood field, I'm just curious if there's anything else in the research. Research that you could look at is, again, the American Association of Sleep. They would have some good research background on that. I don't deal a lot with kids up here. They do have some specialists for our clinic in Marshfield that specifically deal with kids because kids do have sleep apnea. So yes, and it can affect people just like adults. So kids can be affected the same way. With autism specifically, again, I, I don't have a lot of research on that, but I'm sure if you check out those sites, they probably have some other research to, to back it as well. And then my friend here was curious if um, sleep apnea is affected by higher blood pressure or lower blood pressure. 
Usually with blood pressure, if you have sleep apnea, it's hard to control. A lot of patients that go to cardiologists or even their primary care providers, if they're having problems with blood pressure, one of the first things they ask about is sleep apnea for most of the patients. Cardiology and lungs are huge too. So we see a lot of pulmonary and cardiology patients come through. But yes, blood pressure is uh, affected by it. Okay, uh, you've talked about you know alcohol being a problem for people getting sleep and if they drink large amounts of alcohol. Mm -hmm. But is there like you know a drink right before bed of wine or beer or something, uh, a small amount would uh, th that facilitate sleeping or would that be a problematic as well? I usually recommend no alcohol right before bed, only because it gets you so sleepy so fast. It's almost like you sleep fast and you wake up because you're just sleeping so dead. For some people, some people don't. They have a few beers or something like tonight, they go home, they sleep like a rock, they wake up at you know, nine o'clock tomorrow morning. It's if you're having those issues, that's one thing you might wanna dial back on. And again, I usually say a couple hours before, I mean, you can have wine at dinner time or something like that and then go to bed a few hours later. But trial it out, test it out, see if it helps. I've got another online question. What are the health consequences for people who work night shifts? Ah, oh, swing shifters, yeah. It's hard to get those in rhythm sometimes. Depends on how much they swing shift. I mean, if you have a person that is just doing the night shift and they've done it for 10 years, they're used to their sleep pattern. So it's all about patterns. So if you're used to sleeping at night and all of a sudden you get switched to a different shift, it's gonna be hard falling asleep. You're gonna to have to get some good blinds in that room to keep the light out because again, you don't wanna stimulate the brain. Those are the hardest people to get regulated with sleep apnea. The ones that, uh, I always think of the paper mills, they do like seven on PM, seven on nights, seven on days, and they're flipping around. I'm hopeful that most companies now are learning that we have to stick to one shift or the other as much as possible, but it definitely will affect people with their sleep. It might not even be apnea, it might just be like the insomnias and things too. But again, doctors should be involved with that. If you're having those sleep problems, you're a swing shifter, please let your doctor know. There are things that can help out there. Sort of a follow-up to that, we have daylight savings coming up. Do you have any thoughts on that related to sleep? Again, hibernate, hibernate, hibernate. <laughs> Every time you see darkness, what happens to your melatonin? Right? Melatonin builds up in your body, makes you tired at night. So if you have longer days and it's or longer, I should say, dark hours, your melatonin is going to build higher quicker. So you're going to get more tired usually during the darker hours. <laughs> more sleep. That's why I want to be a snowbird. Who did I talk about that with somebody before? But I've heard you talk about sleep patterns. Mm -hmm. um, so if if a certain if people are on a pattern and it's like a it just of course patterns are like something you do every night. Yes. Okay. So if you have a pattern and it can and it goes on all the time, is that less prob that has to be less problematic than people bouncing around and having different sleep modes. So like I have a, I have a pretty established pattern mm -hmm. and I've read that, you know, if you've got this pattern, it's probably okay, you know, but if you're bouncing around, it could be problematic. Absolutely, just like jet lag, if you have a pattern or habit of sleep and you change that pattern or habit, you're not gonna sleep as well. But if you're having problems with that habit, if you're only sleeping a few hours a night, that's when you start looking at different alternatives that you can try. Sometimes you just have to change it with little increments. You never want to change things too fast, especially with sleep, because your body will say, uh-uh, not going to happen. But if you do small things, maybe you go to bed you know, an hour earlier, or again, shorten that nap during the day, things like that that are going to help you maybe sleep a little bit better during the night. But yes, most of us have habits. I mean, my bedtime is usually you know, 9 o'clock, I'm out. So depends on what you're doing, I guess, right? So if that pattern is go to bed at 9 o'clock, wake up for an hour or two from like 3 to 5, then go back to sleep, that's not exactly great either, though, is it? Because I'm right, you're supposed to have uninterrupted sleep, if, that's, if, if that's true. If you can, that's always the best. But you know, some people really have to go to the bathroom. <laughs> so if you do get up, and it depends on how long you slept. You go to bed at like you know 9 o'clock at night, and you get up at 4.30 in the morning to go use the bathroom, and you get up for 5.30 for work, are you going to fall back to sleep? I probably would, but other people maybe not because you've had that sleep in. It's refreshed your body enough where your body's like, okay, I'm ready to go. And you got those thoughts racing in your head about, oh, work today, or the kids are, I got to bake this or cook this. 
So, you know, again, that sleep habit or the patterns could be affected by just stress of your day or thoughts that race at night as well. I have a question about cat naps. Yes. I went hiking this morning for about an hour and a half. Then I went home, laid on my bed, and had a cat nap for 15 minutes. And then I came here after supper. So is that good or bad? How did you feel after your 15-minute cat nap? I feel really invigorated. There you go. Then your body needed it. As long as it doesn't interfere with you falling asleep at night. Because you want to fall asleep at night the best you can. So if you have to limit that during the day, then you do. A lot of people take naps for cat naps. And they're fine. They can sleep all night long as well. So it just depends on what your body needs. <laughs> so maybe related. What if you feel completely wiped out? and it's only 8.30 or 9 p.m. when you normally go to bed at 10.30 or 11, do you just take it and zonk out and see what happens, or sh should you try and make yourself stay awake until your normal bedtime? When I'm tired, I go to bed. Okay. <laughs> well, so, so try it. When you're tired, you take a nap, too. So yeah. Know. You know, listen to your body, but again, if it's starting to cause issues, say you get really tired, you go to bed at like 8 p.m., and then you lay there. Like, well, I was really tired, and now I'm in bed, and I can't fall asleep. It's probably not the thing you should have done, right? So, and it depends on how active you are during the day. So you went hiking, or maybe you had the kids, and you're running around chasing little kids all day long. It really depends on your activity, too, because sometimes you just work outside all day, and you get that fresh air, and you hit that bed at 7.30, and you're out until the morning. It really depends. But again, watch your sleep pattern. And if it becomes a habit, and a habit that's not good for your sleep or you, or you feel symptoms, and you notice something's changing, then it's time to probably either ask your doc or try things on your own to see what you can help with your sleep. Oh, this is going to be a good question. I can see this already. <laughs> I don't know if it's going to be a good question or not. So all of us, I wear an iPhone. My wife wears an Aura ring, and they calculate your different stages of sleep, your light sleep, your art. REM sleep in your deep sleep and things like that and tells you if you got enough in each stage. How much, like if people look at that type of data, how much should you worry about if it says, for example, like you don't get very much deep sleep during the night? Or do you just say, well, it's a device on your wrist, it's probably wrong, you're probably getting enough deep sleep as no, an example. It's, it's a good tool. Um, and, you know, with REM sleep, again, 25% of your sleep is usually REM if you're getting the correct amounts of sleep, of course. Um, so if you're starting to see on those apps where you're maybe waking up, because it'll show on some of them. I've seen like little red lines when you wake up where it kind of, you know, startles you awake. If you're noticing a lot of that on your app, it's not normal. So you want to be in REM at least 25% on a good night for a normal, healthy adult. So if you're seeing a lot less than that, I'd say it's probably time to bring that app in and talk to me or talk to your provider. Um, just again, to be on the safe side, especially if you're having symptoms too. I mean, sometimes it's easier talking to your regular provider right away because you know them and you don't think you maybe have sleep apnea. They'll let you know. They know the symptoms too, so they can talk to you about it. But no, I encourage the apps. I really do. I don't know a lot of them. There's so many different ones, but I love watching the apps when people come in because they're a great tool and they catch so much and people come see me and I love it because now I can treat you and help you. Okay. Well, thank you very much, everybody. Uh, thank you, Mary Stevenson. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, remember our next speaker uh, next month in December, December 7th, will be uh, Jennifer Rayner of UW-Madison speaking on the economics of wolves and deer in Wisconsin. Thanks to everyone for coming and asking questions. This was really great. Thanks to our sponsors or our, our partners, Lakeland Chapter of the Alumni Association and WXPR, UW Trout Lake Station, UW Kemp Natural Resources Station, the Monaco Public Library, and uh, WXPR, and of course our hosts here at Rocky Reef. Thank you so much. And thanks to the Brittingham Fund too for funding us. And don't forget, if you want to be on our email list, we have a clipboard over here. And please sign up. And uh, you'll get an email uh, when it's time for another event. So thanks very much. Have a wonderful evening. Have a wonderful Thanksgiving. And we'll see you next month. <laughs>